billionaire investor Sam Zell of Equity Group Investments joins me here. Sam is a multi-billionaire. It came from nothing. He's author of Am I Being Too Subtle? Our guest host this morning is Sam Zell. Billionaire Sam Zell. Sam Zell. My sense is that uh, we're headed toward a recession. You know, the, uh, I mean, if you think about the fact that uh, in the last four years we've added uh, seven or eight trillion dollars to our debt. Think about the fact that, you know, until just recently, uh, Congress, you know, appropriated money in billions. This is Sam Zell. He was the chairman and founder of Equity Group Investments. He was also a chair in three other publicly traded companies. One of them is Equity Residential, which is one of the largest apartment real estate investment trusts in the world. He also happens to be the founding father of the modern day REIT. Sam is one of the best and most respected business minds, having achieved a net worth of $5.2 billion. For someone who has been investing for 50 years, he must know a thing or two about market cycles. So his comments in this interview caught my attention because it is exactly what is playing out right now. But first, let's start with what Sam Zell thinks of these large real estate giants defaulting on their loans. It's both pretty remarkable, it's pretty dangerous. Um, you know, the, the rule of law is based on uh, everybody, quote unquote, being responsible for their obligations. Uh, if the biggest lender in the country, Blackstone, can walk away from their obligations, who else can? And, uh, you know, and if I'm a, a little guy and I have a two flat, and the question is, what do I do? And I pick up the newspaper and I see Blackstone, Brookfield, and Pimco are all walking away. Why should I feel bad about walking away? Earlier this year, Brookfield defaulted on a $784 million loan on two towers in downtown Los Angeles and a second loan for offices around the Washington DC area. This is due to a combination of two factors. First, it is the Fed's drastically raising the interest rate that caused the cost of borrowing to skyrocket. And second, this post-pandemic area hasn't been too kind to the office sector. As workers prefer to work from home or hybrid, the demand for office space becomes less and less. That resulted in the increase of vacancy rates. Now, the multifamily sector may be fine for now. The high cost of borrowing is making it difficult for prospective home buyers to move into their own homes. That leaves only one alternative for a place to live, and that is to be a renter. But even if rents are at an all-time high, that still doesn't help Blackstone from keeping its obligations. It was a sudden increase in interest rates that led them to the conclusion that the deal no longer makes sense to hold. Now, the reason why Sam says it's dangerous is because there are $1.5 trillion worth of commercial debt coming due in the next two years. And about 67% of those are held by small regional banks. Now, why does this plot look so familiar? Remember 15 years ago when the global financial crisis happened? There were multiple factors that led to the GFC, but one of the primary reasons was not implementing lending standards and greed that ultimately caused borrowers to stop paying. Only time will tell if smaller players will follow suit with these giant firms. That said, what are Sam's thoughts from a buyer's point of view? The buyers and the sellers haven't agreed yet as to what the price is. Uh, the seller is still looking for the number that was on the table, you know, six months ago when interest rates were zero. Now interest rates are three to five and he hasn't adjusted his price. The buyer on the other hand is looking at his cost of capital doubling, uh, his availability of capital diminishing, and he's saying, wow, under these set of circumstances, I gotta get a much better deal than I previously got. Will there be a great buying opportunity ahead? According to Redfin, the median home price is 1.8% higher than last year, despite the increased cost of borrowing. Now, there are a lot of factors behind the high prices, but the biggest one is a lack of available homes to buy. The law of supply and demand states that if there is a shortage of supply, then the price will either remain flat or increase. In the commercial real estate space, everyone is an investor. So what determines a buy or sell is a certain amount of yield or return. I went in depth about how interest rates affect your returns in this video here. So check that video out after watching this one. But what I didn't explain in that video is how interest rates affect cap rates. So let's say a seller is selling a stabilized property with an NOI of 100,000. Most likely that seller bought the property at a lower rate than the current lending rates right now. In order to get the same yield with where the current interest rates are right now, buyers will have to pay a lower price, therefore increasing the cap rate. That is because cap rate and price have an inverse relationship. And that is the reason why the buyer can only pay at a certain price point. Now the seller is also in a bind because they can only lower the price at a certain point. 
point. The seller probably bought the property with a bridge debt, which usually has a high loan to value. So in order for the seller to pay back the loan and hopefully give something back to their investors, they can only lower the price so much without taking a loss. And in the interview, Sam talks about what it takes to break the standstill. I think correction is the right word, but I think the correction is going to take a lot longer hmm. than everybody expects. I mean, there's a certain, you know, mental set in America of, okay, we've finished this version, now let's step, start the next version. And there's never ever an adjustment for what it takes to make that, that transition to cross that bridge. Unlike stocks or cryptocurrency, you can be forced to exit a deal with real estate. And that is due to the kind of loan you have. This is what Sam was talking about. Loans have different due dates, so the changes happen very slowly. It would take a lot of loans coming due and happening in close succession of each other for a major change to happen. As you can see from this chart, sometimes it can take years before you can see a major shift in the market. But for most of the time, the trend is gradual. And Sam was known for paying close attention to trends, so much so that he sold one of his companies when the market was near its peak in 2007. I'm talking about when Sam sold equity office properties to Blackstone for $39 billion. At the time, it was the largest single real estate transaction in history. And then all of a sudden, uh, somebody came along and uh, offered us a, a, a number that was materially higher than our NAV. Well, the moment that occurred, uh, as far as I was concerned, uh, I had an obligation to find out and you know, see if the price discovery was there. And eventually uh, uh, we made a deal and, and that deal was significantly higher than the NAV. And this last point that Sam made is what I think is what separates the good operators from the great operators. It may sound trivial, but it is the biggest reason why investors lose money on deals. I've always felt that the day you quote, take the public's money, uh, there's a definition of who you're obligated to. Uh, when you're investing your own capital in a private situation, you're, in, you're, you're indebted to yourself. The moment you go public, uh, the moment you take in public capital, that's the moment at which the public's interest is what should govern your decisions. This comes as a shocker that in the real estate space, we deal a lot of the building and the numbers, but it's actually a very relationship-based business. Now, you may have noticed that I've been using the words was or formerly when referring to Sam's involvement with his companies. It's not because he quit or retired, but because he passed away in May of this year. As an immigrant myself, I was inspired by his story after reading his book, Am I Being Too Subtle? In fact, Sam dedicated chapter one of the book to all immigrants, which is titled An Impossible Life. That chapter explains how he was able to achieve all his accomplishments because of the way he was brought up. This is how he explains it. I was born uh, 90 days after my parents came to this country. So my parents landed in Seattle uh, May 18th, 1941. And I was born September 28th, 1941. Um, maybe the best way to exemplify that impossible life, etc is the fact that the ship docked in Seattle at 6 a.m. And at 6 p.m., my parents went to their first English class, uh, wow. which is indicative of the immigrant. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I dedicated the book to the immigrant. And uh, more than anything else, I grew up in a household where my father and mother constantly reassured me or told me that this is America. This is where the streets are paved with gold and that gold is not what you pick up. It's the opportunity to pick it up. That's what America really is all about. And uh, therefore, I grew up in an environment where I didn't know that anything wasn't possible. Now, there are a couple of things that not a lot of people know about Sam. One of them is that he's a wonderful philanthropist. He sponsored multiple educational programs to set up our young entrepreneurs up for success. And another is that he likes riding motorcycles. His motorcycle group of entrepreneurs is called the Zell's Angels. Anyway, I hope you not only learned something from this video, but also found inspiration from the life of Samuel Zell. Thank you for watching.